of Matthew 17. Beginning with verse 1, we read, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And the disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming First, and will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understand, understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis's books as a whole, but specifically from the book Prince Caspian, is when Lucy comes up to Aslan in the forest, seeing him again for the first time in the book there. And it says, uh, it says, Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. Aslan responds, That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are. Lucy responding, and he says, I am not. But every year you grow, you find me bigger. In other words, the longer you know, the Lord, the bigger you get, the more you understand, the more you see of his love, of his character, of his great grace. And as the disciples walked with Jesus, their perspective of him continued to change, growing, him becoming bigger and bigger. Every experience they had with him added to their knowledge of him. And so as we study this passage, we'll see as we look at the transfiguration here, what it's like when we see more of Jesus for who he is. Beginning in verses 1 to 3 here, we see the way that we see Jesus changes necessarily as it says now after six days jesus took peter james and john his brother and led them to a high mountain by themselves six days after they were in caesarea philippi where peter of course made his confession that jesus is the christ the son of the living god so he takes them to a high mountain it says now traditionally 
it's been believed that it was Mount Tabor in Israel. The problem is, Tabor isn't a high mountain. It's 2,000 feet high, and which isn't big as far as a mountain goes. Other people believe it was Mount Hermon, which is near, right next to Caesarea Philippi. The problem was it, with it is, it's too tall. In fact, there's snow on it most of the time. So it's not really some place you go to hang out. Maybe skiing, but they didn't do a lot of that back then. But to the southwest, there's another mountain, the Mount Moran. And it seems to be just the right size, about 4,000 feet. It would be considered a high mountain, but not too high. But, of course, we can't be absolutely sure, and ultimately it really doesn't matter the location, but what happened there. Then the next question that comes up automatically, besides the mountain, is... Why did Jesus only take these three guys? Now, there's some different ideas about that as well. The first is that he only took three of them because he didn't want the news, the story to get out too quick. Because, you know, expectations were building already. And he was hesitant to do that. Personally, I don't really believe that's the case. The second option is that these three men's kind, men kind of form Jesus' inner circle. And they would receive more insights than the other. The third suggestion is, uh, which is probably the most likely, at least in Peter's case, well, actually all three of them, is that these three needed closer, closer supervision. Remember, it was Peter who would always blurt something out. It was Peter who would cut off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Remember, James and John. They said, those guys, as they were walking through Samaria, and the Samaritans in that location wouldn't receive them, that they said, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and fry these guys? So they could need closer supervision. But as well, there are two other occasions when Jesus called these three aside as well. With the healing of Jairus' daughter in Luke chapter 8. They took him, they, he took them to the room where the little girl lay. And also he took them with him further into the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed prayed to the Father in that great time of trial in Matthew 26. It's very likely that Jesus was preparing them for the things that they would face in the future. And that's what he does in each of our lives. The things that we're going through now or a preparation for what he wants to do in our lives in the future. It's all a preparation. Everything that's happened in our past is there to instruct us in in how he wants to use us, how he wants to work in our lives in the future. Then he goes on to say in verse 2, And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. The Greek word translated transfigured here literally means to change in form, not just in outward appearance, but to have his very form changed. This change wasn't simply external, but it radiates from the inside and changes the whole person. Moses 
reflected the glory of God when he had come when he came down from the mountain from visiting God when remember when he had to put the veil over his face he went up there and he was in the presence of God for so long and when he came down all the people were kind of freaked out because he was glowing and they didn't know anything about radioactivity back then so they they probably would have been more scared but but he was glowing so they he put a veil over his face when he is in front of people until the glory totally faded. But that was simply reflected glory from being in the presence of God. But in Jesus, it came from who he is. That glory shining out of who he is. We see with Jesus... In John chapter 17, verse 5, he talks about being glorified with the glory that he had with the Father before the world was. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, we see the fourth man in the fiery furnace who Nebuchadnezzar describes as being one like the Son of God. In the accounts of Paul's conversion, we have the description of this great light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining down. And, of course, Paul, who was called Saul at the time, fell off his horse and heard that voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He was there in the unrestrained presence of Jesus. Now, the miracle of this on the mountain of transfiguration is really often misunderstood. The miracle isn't that Jesus shone like the sun. The miracle is the rest of the time when he didn't. That he withheld his glory being in the presence of people. And here on the mountain of transfiguration, he simply ceased to restrain. The transfiguration was a preview, a foretaste of what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. In his glory, in his power. Destroying every enemy. Restoring all things. And now, you and I, even in this time, as we walk with the Lord, we can get a foretaste of glory. You've heard the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. As we draw closer to Jesus, as we see him working in and through our lives, we get a foretaste of that glory. And as Jesus told Martha by the tomb of Lazarus, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? And then it says in verse 3, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah have this conversation with Jesus about his departure in Luke chapter 9. Moses represents the law, Elijah the prophet. And some have speculated that they are the two witnesses spoken of in Revelation chapter 11 because of the miracles that are associated with them. Moses dealt with water changing to blood and other plagues, while Elijah 
is connected with fire from heaven and drought. Moses might also, as some have speculated, represent all those who die and go to heaven, while Elijah represents those who are caught up to heaven without death, those who are raptured out. And the cool thing about this, I mean, things are getting so muddled in the world today. And why this, one reason that this passage is so important, and you think, well, why is it included in three of the Gospels? And why is it considered so important? Is it gives us stark evidence of the uniqueness of Jesus. And to be very honest with things getting so confused and Eastern mysticism being so prevalent, it makes a clear distinction between resurrection and reincarnation. These guys aren't reincarnated. They're exactly who they always were, and they were recognized as such. There was no need for any introduction. They were not in any other form. And there's no room for mixing Christianity with any other religions in order to come up with something new. You'll find many books today by supposedly Christian authors doing just that. In fact, a year or two ago, there was this parliament of world religions, of the world religions, and they, were, they basically met for that purpose, to get all the world's religions together, and the only ones they didn't have any tolerance for were born-again Christians. They were tolerant of everybody else. But that's the whole thing, trying to get all the world's religions together and confuse things. We see how we see an important distinction here. While the way we see Jesus may change as we get a fuller look at his glory, Jesus himself never changes. As it says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're the ones who are being changed. As it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, but we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're being changed. And as it goes on here in verses 4 through 8, the next thing we see that the important thing is for us to listen to Jesus. It says, Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. We're told in Mark 9, 6 and Luke 9, Three that Peter didn't know what to say, so he just blurted this out. Here you are, standing in the presence of Jesus, fully radiating his glory. Peter there. Jesus, can we build you a tent? He followed his normal pattern. If he didn't know what to say, he would say anything. He suggests building these three tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. Unwittingly, in doing this, he, in a sense, was putting all, of, all three, Moses and Elijah and Jesus, on an equal level. And that wouldn't be acceptable. Any more than as Hebrews 3.3 3 says that the builder of the house gets greater glory than the house. Jesus created those other two guys. He's not on an equal level with them. 
Jesus isn't one among many, but is the one and only. We do the Lord and the people we share with a great disservice if we allow Jesus to just be grouped with a bunch of other religious leaders. Jesus is to have preeminence in our lives. As it says in Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. While Jesus is speaking, it says in verses 5 and 6, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came from, from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they did what could be expected. They fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. While Peter was still running off at the mouth, a great cloud overshadows the three disciples. The same cloud that was on Mount Sinai in Exodus 24, 15, as a manifestation of the presence of God. The same cloud that led them in the wilderness. In Exodus chapter 13, the same cloud that covered and filled the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 40, then God himself speaks from the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The father cuts through all the vague religious nonsense to get to the heart of the matter. Peter is corrected by God himself so there would be no confusion over who exactly they were dealing with. There is to be no confusion in our lives as to who Jesus is overall and who he is to be in our lives individually preeminent if we truly recognize Jesus for who he is we'll do exactly what the father said to do hear him we'll pay attention to what Jesus has to say to us and we'll walk in obedience because you know the truth is, if you really want to see Jesus for who he is, that's what's necessary. That we walk in obedience to him. That we follow him close as possible. No half-hearted commitment. Then we read in verses 7 and 8, it says, But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Of course, when the disciples heard the voice, they were overwhelmed by the glory of God and fell on their faces in fear. Have you ever been overwhelmed by the awe and glory of God as you worshiped? Just had such a sense of his presence. Maybe you were going about your daily business when God suddenly stepped into a situation and manifested his presence in your life. Something that totally couldn't be mistaken for anything else. And you're caught up in the all of him. The disciples were so blown away because of what had taken place was so far beyond their comprehension. But look at how Jesus ministers to those guys. Here he just re revealed himself as the I am, God incarnate in the flesh, shining in his glory.
they hear the voice of the Father himself. They're there on their faces, and Jesus simply walks over to them and touches them, and says, get up, guys. Don't be afraid. And of course, this is the one of those 365 times the Bible says, don't be afraid. One for every day. Everyone else was gone. And there was nothing else to vie for their attention. Any legitimate experience in the Lord will leave you with your eyes focused on the Lord. Anything that would draw your attention away from the Lord is counterfeit. And then we see in verses 9 through 13... We're, how we're to keep everything <clears throat> in perspective. As it says in verse 9, Now they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, or as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now you might be wondering again, you know, here we have this combination of Jesus revealing himself and Jesus concealing himself. What's taking place here? You might wonder why he didn't want them to share openly. The truth is that at this point, it would cause confusion. It would be truth taken out of context for most people. We've already seen how they've wanted to make him, take him and make him king. Make him some sort of earthly king. Imagine if this story started to get around. The reason is that the nature of Jesus can't be fully understood apart from the crucifixion and the resurrection. What he came to do, the purpose of his coming, you can't fully know Jesus apart from that. And what are those people seeking to change the gospel, trying to do? Exactly that. Remove the necessity of the cross. Remove the necessity of the resurrection. And saying it's still fine. No, absolutely not. As Paul told the Corinthians, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, your faith is in vain, you're still in your sins. And this is why there's so many misconceptions about Jesus today. People want to take aspects of Jesus' nature out of context of what he came to accomplish. And we see this today in the social justice movement, liberation theology, mainly in uh, Hispanic countries to the South, the prosperity movement. So many of these false movements today, the emergent church, all of these, what they seek to do is just take a part of the nature of Jesus and emphasize that. But as Matthew recorded in the first chapter of his gospel, in verse 21, the purpose of his coming was that he would come to save his people from their sins. It's a sin issue. To save them from the penalty, the power, and ultimately the presence of sin. And then we see in verse 10, it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Now the disciples tried to put what they've just experienced 
with Jesus into context with what they had heard from the scribes. From Malachi chapter 4, it would seem that Elijah had to come first before the Messiah. In their experience, Jesus came first. And they saw, because they saw Elijah with Moses in the presence of Jesus on the mountain. They were seeing what they thought might be a contradiction to the word or what they had been taught about or from the word. So they did what we should do when we have something, we confront something in the scripture that we think is an apparent contradiction. They took it to Jesus and allowed him to clarify the issue. I love it with the guys on the Emmaus Road after the resurrection. They're walking along and, and they're talking and you know, getting this discussion about what had just taken place and you know, discussing what had just transpired in Jerusalem. And Jesus shows up and his glory again is hidden from these guys. And they're talking and Jesus comes up and says, what are you guys talking about? And they said, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that you don't know went on? And you started talking about Jesus. And he said, we had hoped that he would be the one to deliver Israel. And he said to them, oh, foolish men, slow of heart to believe all that the scripture has said. And he shares with them the gospel through the entirety of scripture. And then when they get to Emmaus, he sits down at the table with them by their invitation. And he sits down. And when he breaks bread, their eyes are opened. And he disappears from their presence. He said, and then they say to one another, didn't our hearts burn within us as he revealed the scripture to us? Burning hearts. Putting those things in context, and that's what Jesus is doing for the disciples here. And then it goes on in verses 11 through 13 to say, Jesus answered them, answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the son of man is about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that they spoke, that he spoke to them of John the Baptist Jesus responds to their, to their questions, referring to, again, to Malachi, but chapter 3, verse 23. John the Baptist had come in the spirit and the power of Elijah, partially fulfilling the prophecies related to him. Some of those prophecies are for the future, like Malachi 4, 5. And will be fulfilled when Elijah comes as one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. The scribes and the other Jewish leaders missed out on what God was doing through John the Baptist because they were focused on that one aspect of whom Elijah was to be. In the same way they missed out on Jesus being the Messiah because they were focused on one aspect of his nature. They looked solely at things that were positive for themselves selfishly. When we make Jesus 
when we receive Jesus as our Lord. There's no picking and choosing. I've heard the term in the past couple of years, someone referring to themselves as a cafeteria Christian. Meaning they can just go through the line and pick and choose what they want. Sorry, Jesus won't have it. He doesn't desire a half-hearted, halfway commitment. It's all or nothing. Jesus said, I'd have you hot or cold. The church in Laodicea. Because you're neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And, whoa, harsh words. But reality. Jesus knows what it takes to have a relationship with God through him. He went to the cross for it. He knows what it takes. He knows what it takes for us as well. But as he says in John as well, I won't leave you comfortless, but I'll send the spirit, the comforter. He'll guide you into all truth. And in Acts chapter 1, he said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses. He knew we couldn't live the Christian life in our own strength. We can't. It's silly to even think that we can. So he gives us the power, the enabling to do just that. As we've seen, the way we see Jesus changes as we get to know him better. He doesn't change, but we do. And our perspective as of him changes. As we listen to him, he reveals more and more of his glory to us. And we're changed, as the scripture says, from glory to to glory and the way that we see Jesus then sets the perspective for everything else in our lives the question for us though then is how are we seeing Jesus are we seeing him for who he is or something we've tried to make him to be Or are we drawing closer to him and allowing him to change our hearts and our lives? And our primary focus in everything to be changed into his image and that he might receive the glory from our lives in whatever aspect of our lives we talk, we're talking about. Whether it be our work, our daily lives, our relationships, everything. When we step out the door, in fact, when we wake up out of bed in the morning, before we set our first foot on the ground, it should be, Lord, what do you have? What do you desire? What do you want to do today, Lord? This is about you, not about me. That's when life truly gets exciting. You know, we can make Jesus a lot less in our lives. And you can have a lot less of a life. Or you can make Jesus everything and have everything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Lord God. And how it reveals who you are, Lord. Your grace, your love, your power, your mercy. Lord, continue, we pray, 
to reveal yourself to each one of us from glory to glory. Lord, that we might be more like you, Lord. That people would take note that we've been with Jesus. Give us the grace, the strength, and the power to walk in you, Lord. That you, in it all, might receive glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If anyone here doesn't have such a relationship with Jesus, I'd love to pray with you. I'll be here after the service ends to pray with anyone. I'd love to help you to get to know Jesus for all he is. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you guys. Let's stand as we worship the Lord with one more song. Some power and love, our God is an awesome God.